Well, thank you all and welcome. Uh, I'm glad you're here. It's, uh, it's good that uh, we're getting a turnout like this. We, I know we have a whole bunch more registered, so uh, we'll see as they filter in. But in the sake of trying to keep things on time, let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, and a couple of our key speakers, we're working out the, the timing on getting them here. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Carl Morehouse. I am on the Ventura City Council. Our formal name is San Buenaventura. The rest of you know us as Ventura. And I actually have the honor and pleasure of serving as the president of the Southern California Association of Governments. For those of you also are not full, totally familiar with SCAG, SCAG is the largest federally recognized metropolitan planning organization in the United States. It covers the 39,000 square miles, 18, almost 19 million people of the 191 city, uh, cities and the six counties of Ventura, Los Angeles, Orange, San Bernardino, Riverside, and Imperial. And uh, that's quite a responsibility. Uh, as a result of what we're supposed to do by state and federal mandate, which is a regional transportation plan every four years, with the introduction and passage a couple years ago of State Senate Bill 375, we've now been required to incorporate in that process development of something called a sustainable community strategy. And in developing our RTP slash SCS a couple of years ago, our leadership at the time, and particularly Asana Krata, our executive director, did a true planner's effort in reaching out broader and wider into our greater Skag region to involve a number of participants in the development of that. Sort of simultaneously, or actually prior to that last process, some five years ago, uh, media past president Larry McCallum, Larry, where are you hiding out? I know you're out there somewhere over here. Started the process of discussing the economic situation of our region. So this is our fifth economic summit, and it's been an interesting, morphing, evolutionary process. In the past, it's been carried on by immediate past President Pam O'Connor, Glenn Becerra, I saw him wandering around out there somewhere, and immediate past President Greg Pettis. And uh, where we are now, actually as of the last economic summit one year ago, we heard some interesting statistics starting to emerge about our economic situation post-recession and just in general about the Skag region. One of the things that emerged most starkly was the fact that about one in four children in our region are in poverty. And that struck a number of people, private sector, public sector, uh, very strongly. Thank goodness, due to the work of a group that was put together also to the development of our SCS, the one we call the GLUE Council, which is the Global Land Use and Economy Council, a number of business leaders got together and took this to heart. They were as dismayed as many of us in the public sector are about what was happening with poverty in our region. And they made this a mission. So for those of you who were fortunate enough to attend back on August 20th, which happened to be the 50th anniversary signing by President Lyndon Johnson of the legislation for the war on poverty, we rolled out then a pretty spectacular picture of the poverty situation in our region. And then we decided that with the direction of the GLUE Council and our partnership with the Southern California Leadership Council, who's also made up of ex-electeds and, and business people, to focus today's economic summit on addressing some of those issues head on and what we can do to get ourselves out of it. Um, I can tell you flat out, we're not going to have any solutions here today. If there was a silver bullet in the last 50 years, I think we would have found it. But in recognizing that we have a problem in this region, we'll be able to finally pull together, and that is the role of SCAG in this process, is to be the convener. Because the one thing that we do have in the SCAG uh, quiver of arrows is the capacity to reach out to a number of different organizations, a number of different stakeholders from the three legs of the sustainability stool, the environment, the economy, and uh, the social equity sides of it. So uh, we will have a great discussion today. I hope there's a lot of good information you'll come away from this with. Uh, some suggestions are being offered of what we can do in developing our sustainable community strategy and moving forward. And uh, hopefully you'll come away with some takeaways after, by the end of the day when we wrap it up. Now, I've got Hassan leaning over my shoulder, so I've got to deal with two things. Hold on, quick commercial message. Senator is here, but introduce Don and then... Right, okay, very good. A couple of housekeeping things. First of all, I'm supposed to announce, you're saying, well, my table doesn't have a tablecloth on it. I know that was high on your thinking. 
Just we wanted to share with you that the, the efforts of the Weston Bonaventure in efforts to save and react to our drought, they have pulled back on all their linens, seriously, because they don't want to launder them and they didn't want to use the water. So if you're disappointed, <laughs> secondly, the necessary rooms, if you don't know where they are, they're out and around the corner. That's critical information. Okay, uh, at this point, I am going to uh, take a quick second, though, and, and uh, bring up to the stage one of our regional council members, a longtime cheerleader of, of the region, a longtime cheerleader, particularly of his city of Los Angeles, and that is Council Member Tom Labonge. Carl, thank you very much. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Thank you. Carl, that's all for you. And the sound people. Without the sound people, we can't be here. Give the sound people a big hand there. On behalf of Mayor Eric Garcetti and all the City Council, welcome to SCAG and so important what you do. You represent the entities where some people go for the first time to get help on that course to find success for job creation and economic development. The people who work for our cities in a variety of capacities need our support to be able to know we've got to help people and they can find a way to achieve their goals in economic development. I'm just so proud, as an Angelino, how great Southern California is in all the counties. I'm so proud of the old towns that have been recreated. And as years ago, we used to spread all the way out. Now there's a lot of implosion where the villages, whether it's Monrovia, or whether it's San Bernardino, whether it's West Hollywood, all the little towns are being towns. Because people love a neighborhood, and that's what it's all about. But I just wanted to welcome you again on behalf of Mayor Garcetti. And if you have any questions, just call 485-3337. And if you're outside the area code, it's 1-800-TOM-LABONJA. I'll help you. Thank you. Talk about brevity. I wasn't counting on that, Tom. I was thinking you're going to stretch it a little bit. Okay. Um, it is my pleasure. Uh, I'm going to change the batting order a little bit. Uh, I was just talking about one of our major partners in this, and that's the Southern California Leadership Council. And uh, they have been very, very important. When, when you have people, particularly in the business sector, that embrace this issue, realizing the relationship between jobs, uh, training, and, and by the way, you're saying, well, how does SCAG as a planning organization get into this? The uh, SCS part of the requirement now makes us look more at land use relationships and makes us look at jobs housing balance. And that begs the greater question, who are we planning for? So as we start to look at where the jobs are and what those types of jobs are and goods movement and everything else that we're doing in transportation, we have to pay attention to the people who are going to be impacted by that. So with the work of the Southern California Leadership Council, uh, we are able to address some of this again in the private sector. So it is my pleasure to bring up to you somebody who probably doesn't need a lot of introduction because he was, he was our wonderful governor for a number of years. And if I can stop the, the council member from Los Angeles, <laughs> I'll bring you up right now. The Honorable Gray Davis. Thank you, Carl. I want to salute Tom Labonge, who's one of the great cheerleaders for Southern California, and give him a round of applause. He's been great to work with. Thank you, Carl. I had a chance to be with you when we had the Poverty Con uh, Conference at the Science Center, and um, I'm very pleased to be here and very pleased that this is the fifth year that the Southern California Leadership Council has partnered with SCAG. Uh, we'd love to partner with you because uh, you're uh, the rubber that meets the road. You are elected officials, council members, mayors. Uh, you have to make things happen, not talk about them, make them happen. Uh, and also you have uh, great influence in Sacramento because every legislator uh, who has mayors and council people in the district does not want those people running against them for re-election. Re so when you have an idea, uh, he or she will listen and, and uh, give it their full attention. And I want to share with you some ideas, a little bit about the challenge of poverty and also the challenge to the middle class as it relates to um, job growth in Southern California. Uh, first, let me say that uh, when Lyndon Johnson declared war on poverty over 50 years ago, uh, we did make a good deal of progress. Um, however, that progress has been eroded by the Great Recession that started in 2007 and 8. 
That recession also wreaked havoc uh, with middle class jobs. Um, those jobs that were lost are slowly being replaced, but the first point I want to make is they're being replaced with jobs that pay far lower salaries. The second point I want to make, and it was in the LA Times today, is that the participation rate in the workforce, all of us focus on the unemployment rate, which looks good because it's coming down, but the participation rate, which really means what percentage of the workforce is contributing to the GDP, that has dropped since the start of the Great Recession from roughly 66% statewide down to about 62.3%. So what does that mean? That means there are fewer people contributing to our gross domestic product, and those that are, are bringing home uh, lower uh, medium household incomes. So they have less money to spend on goods and services. Employers have less reason to add to their payroll. Uh, state and, uh, and local governments get less revenue. So all of that is a big challenge. And uh, one thing I learned from my brother, who 25 years ago uh, uh, volunteered to be part of uh, Alcohol Anonymous, uh, he said the first thing when you walk in there, you have to admit you have a problem. We have a problem, really two problems. One is fewer people are, are working and those who are working are making less money. Now you say, well, doesn't everybody have this problem? Well, not really. Um, if you look at SCAG economists and compare us to Northern California, the Northern California uh, average medium household income is $80,000. In Southern California, $58,000. In Northern California, the average educational attainment is 43% uh, is over, is at least a four-year degree or more. Uh, in Southern California, only 29%. Also, in Southern California, one out of four children live in poverty, and 17.7% .7 of the population lives in poverty. So we have big challenges, but I am confident we can meet those challenges uh, if we are bold and if we think big. I grew up, um, I, I came to California in the late 50s, and I remember growing up here in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and our economy in Southern California was the envy of the rest of the state. I mean, we were the home of aerospace. We were the home of the entertainment industry. Uh, LA County by itself, but certainly Southern California, it, uh, was the largest manufacturing region in, this, in the country, probably still are, but we have fewer jobs manufacturing than we did then. Now, Northern California, Silicon Valley, not much was happening. Matter of fact, in the 60s, there really wasn't a Silicon Valley. Um, but they didn't say, oh, woe is me. You know, we didn't get, uh, we didn't win the lottery. You know, we'll just have to go on food stamps. They said, let's plan. Let's partner with universities. Let's reinvent our future, start innovating. And today, they are changing the world. If they can do it, we can do it. And we do it against the context of probably greater competition from the other 50 states. Obviously, California competes, and Southern California competes with countries all around the world. But like in New York, I grew up in New York before I moved out here, uh, they have 10 regions in that state where if you move a business there, no taxes for 10 years, no property taxes, no sales taxes, no corporate taxes. So. Uh, that's pretty stiff competition. I wouldn't even consider suggesting that to Sacramento. But I am going to make a suggestion that I think will get your attention. I am proposing, because I think we have to think big and be bold. So I am proposing we have a five-year moratorium on any legislation that is more likely to reduce jobs than create jobs. You can call it the California Economic Impact Law, uh, and it's, it would require an analysis to determine, will this bill, be it on safety, the environment, some other purpose, will this bill more likely reduce jobs or more likely increase jobs? If it's in the reduced job category, it cannot be considered for at least five years. That will give us time to hit the pause button so we can reinvent ourselves, we can plan, we can reimagine our future, 
uh, we can work with universities, uh, and we can um, uh, come out of this uh, better, stronger, with more people working. But the last thing we need are just more and more laws coming down, putting more and more burdens on businesses, even, even in the name of good. Sacramento only does things in the name of good, and everything it does in the abstract is good, but the cumulative effect it makes it very hard to grow a business. You can't grow a business. You can't hire people. If you can't hire people, uh, they really don't have any chance at the American dream. I like to say uh, that every dream begins with a job. But if you can't get a job, you start losing faith in the American dream. So a lot is at stake here. And, uh, even uh, some of the people uh, uh, in this state who are not terribly interested in the economy, I generally get their attention when I say, you know, at some point, don't you want your son or daughter to move out of the house? Get a job and get an apartment so you can become an empty nester at some point. So we all, whatever the motivation, we all have a stake in seeing job growth uh, return to Southern California. Good jobs. Now, we also need a long game. The short game, five-year moratorium, hit the pause button, let's reimagine, rethink, um, uh, and redevelop our future with better jobs and better um, and greater participation. The long, the long plan. We have to double down on education. Uh, universal pre-K for every child. That's proven to be an enormous winner uh, from every perspective. Financially, uh, you save at least seven dollars for every dollar you spend, and you have to spend that seven on a bunch of entitlement programs. Uh, moreover, you get children, and more importantly, in my mind, get them learning early, learning that learning itself is a lifetime uh, occupation, not just something you do uh, K through 12 or K through college or K through uh, graduate degree. It's a lifetime enterprise. And also, I think we need to rethink how we educate people. I mean, most of us with gray hair in this room and some of you who are hiding it like I used to do with uh, hair, hair color and all that stuff, we did pretty well under the old model. The old model was education would teach you about the world, give you skill sets, uh, and prepare you to go out and find a job on your own. They didn't feel any responsibility to do that. They just educated you and, and pr prepared you to be a, 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 a good citizen. Well, those days, unfortunately, are behind us, and we need education to do that, plus uh, help teach you marketable job skills and help get you a job. In my view, their job is not done until people can walk in, uh, get a paycheck, and then start contributing to the university. So again, there's a good feedback mechanism for the universities if they don't, if their uh, graduates don't get jobs, then you're not going to raise a lot of money to support the institution. So. We need to be thinking not only about what can be done at the K through 12 level, but also what can be done at the uh, uh, in higher education, not just to educate people, but prepare people for real world jobs. And those jobs tend to change about every year. So you need employers uh, actively involved in developing online courses. Again, the degrees are not what they used to be. If you have job skills, if you can show certificates of completion of particular courses at an Intel or a Cisco or a Google want, then you'll get an interview and you may get the job. You can do that as an existing worker, making thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a year. You want to upgrade your skill sets, maybe get a job at seventy five or eighty thousand dollars. You don't have the time or the luxury to pack up and sit at a community college or at a um, four year college you need to take that uh, course online. There are many courses that provide that, and we ought to promote that as well. So focus on K through 12, focus on pre-K, but realize we need to ask more of higher education in order to get people uh, situated in the workforce. Uh, undertake serious regulatory reform. I laugh because it seems to be our mantra at, at, at SCAG. I mean, uh, not at SCAG, well, SCAG, but also the Southern California Leadership Council. Let me just give you one statistic. California ranks 46th uh, in the time it takes to get a project approved. Now, what does that mean? That means your son or daughter have a better chance to get a job in 45 other states than they do in California. 46. Um, I will tell you a story of, 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 of one um, 
company that after 17 years has uh, 19 different agencies, every agency they need, give them uh, all the approvals. Uh, it's now in sort of a litigation limbo. Um, that project uh, uh, will produce 120,000 jobs, 70,000 of which are permanent, permanent. I went to the uh, SC UCLA game, they had 83,000. 70,000 is a lot of people. And they have families and they will feel better about themselves and they'll have money in their pockets and good things will happen. We can't afford to wait 17 years, much less how much longer it's gonna take before the courts resolve this issue, um, uh, before those jobs come online. It's simple math. The quicker the project is approved, the sooner people can get to work, uh, feel better about themselves, contribute to their society, buy goods and services, and pay their fair share to local and state government. Uh, so we have to get serious about job development and job creation in this state. A couple other ideas uh, for your consideration. Uh, if you drive the Pasadena Freeway, uh, you'll realize that that was the f first freeway built uh, to allow people living in the Pasadena area to commute to downtown Los Angeles. It was actually a WPA project. The Hoover Dam which we depend on today in Colorado, uh, is, is a, uh, or the Colorado River is um, a WPA project. An awful lot of bridges and roads in Northern California is a WPA project. You know, this government-sponsored infrastructure program called the WPA worked pretty good in the 20th century. Uh, you might give that some consideration in the 21st century. Uh, because we need to get uh, roads, bridges, and infrastructure repair underway as quickly as we can. I don't think anyone disputes that. Uh, and whether we partner with the private sector in financing it or government goes, al goes alone, it doesn't make a great deal of difference to me. It gets people to work and it, it rebuilds our infrastructure. So that's one thing I would strongly recommend for your consideration. Raise the federal minimum wage, no-brainer. California has raised uh, its wage, Seattle, other cities. When people have more money in their pocket, they spend it. So you, the, the, these folks become businesses' customers. If they don't spend money, businesses will, are not going to add to their payroll. Plus, if you don't give people a decent living, they're not going to believe in the American dream. So there are a few ideas uh, that I want to share with you. So let me just say this in summation. We have big challenges, but we can meet those challenges. We need a breather from Sacramento to give us time to do that. This is your challenge as elected officials around the state. Sacramento will give you credibility. You can change minds. But what we can't do is sit around and wait and expect someone else is going to solve the problem because they are not. You are going to solve the problem. We are going to stand with you. All three governors, Wilson, DeManchin, and I, were asking Arnold to join us. I think at some point he will. Uh, we're going to stand shoulder to shoulder with you. Every economic authority from Ventura to, to the Mexican border is going to stand shoulder to shoulder with you. But we have to remind people that the reason California is the envy of the world is that people from India to China the Latin America, they believe that if they have talent, work hard, good things will happen to them in California. For most of our existence, that has been the case. That dream is now under challenge. We can meet that challenge if we work together, but we can only meet it if we recognize we have a problem and that uh, we've got to change business in Sacramento to give us time to solve that problem. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having SCAG be a partner with uh, uh, Southern California Leadership, be a comp partner. We look forward to being with you next year. Thank you, Governor Davidson. And I would be remiss, uh, and I forgot to mention that the uh, Southern California Leadership Council. Uh, is this nonpartisan nonprofit organization that was uh, created in 2005 uh, by Governor Davis in conjunction with former governors Duke Majin and, and Wilson, along with current Governor uh, Brown? Uh, good proof that 
forgetting the partisan letter that follows your last name, that we can work together, particularly in understanding that what we need to do to make Southern California competitive again. It is now my uh, great honor to, uh, to introduce our next speaker. Uh, he's one of the key partners in, uh, with us in Sacramento. Uh, he is recently sworn in as the current president pro tem, uh, following on the heels of Daryl Steinberg, who authored Senate Bill 375 that we now live with, with our RTPSCS. Senator Kevin DeLeon uh, is a member of the state legislature for the past eight years. He's earned a reputation as a common sense policymaker who's unafraid to take on complex issues. He ushered through workers' compensation reform to lower insurance costs for businesses while protecting workers and increasing their benefits. His California Secure Choice Retirement Savings Trust Act has been called a model for addressing a national problem by the New York Times. He co-chaired the campaign for Proposition 39, the California Clean Energy Jobs Act, helping to create more than 40,000 California jobs, according to the nonpartisan legislative analyst office, and generating billions of dollars of cal for California schools and energy efficient projects. It is such a wonderful pleasure to have this person with this title being from our region, because if there's going to be somebody who understands our regional problems and can carry this message back to Sacramento that we need to part with, it is the President Pro Tem. Let me introduce to you Honorable Kevin DeLeon. Thank you so very much, Carl. Good morning to each and every one of you. And to uh, Governor uh, Gray Davis, you know, thank you very much for uh, your very insightful uh, and wonderful uh, remarks. As always, uh, we're indebted to you for your strong leadership as a, a public elected official who has always dedicated uh, his life, his career. Uh, to the well-being of all Californians, regardless of who you are and you know, regardless of where you come from. Obviously, uh, a native New Yorker, but a Californian, you know, true and true. So I want to thank you very much. Let's give it up for Governor Gray Davis, please. Good morning to each and every one of you. It's an honor and a pleasure. Carl, thank you very much uh, for the very kind introduction. Uh, I know it's, uh, you have a very compelling program today, uh, SCAG, with regards to the regional economy, uh, more specifically uh, the future of Southern California. I also uh, commend you for devoting part of your program uh, to the issue of poverty uh, in California. It's absolutely very critical that we tackle this issue head on. Uh, because it impacts the eighth largest economy in the entire world. I want to put this in context because I, I really enjoyed Governor Gray Davis's uh, comments with regard to Southern California more specifically. Um, sort of a, a little macro perspective at the uh, uh, 10,000 feet uh, level uh, uh, with regards to our economy. California's economy right now is $2.2 trillion. Uh, we have a $2.2 trillion GDP making us the eighth largest economy in the entire world. If you juxtapose that with the second largest economy in the United States, that would be the state of Texas with a $1.1 trillion GDP. So ours is twice of that of the state of Texas. Again, being the eighth largest economy in the entire world, we just surpassed Russia as well as Italy uh, being the eighth largest economy in the world, and we're on the heels of surpassing the Republic of Brazil. Now, Brazil's economy has been growing quite tremendously uh, in Southern California, obviously within not Southern California, South America, within the Western Hemisphere, they are a growing power. We will, I'm fully confident, surpass uh, 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 Brazil to be the seventh largest GDP in the entire world. Now, we have 11% of the nation's population here in the state of California. And while we have 11% of that population, we do receive uh, over half of all venture capital investments originate and their final destination is here in the state of California. We do receive over one quarter of the patents in the United States of America right here in the state of California. Uh, we added 410,000 jobs, 410,000 brand new jobs in 2013. Uh, that makes us the largest producer of jobs in the United States of America, bar none. Our, un, our employment rate with regards to jobs increased one full percentage point to 2.8 percent. The national average growth rate right now is 1.8 percent. The good news is job growth in California is expected to outpace the rest of the nation in the decades ahead. Now that being said, if we disaggregate the data, because I really enjoyed Governor Davis's comments, 
The California economy is growing. There's no question about that. If you take the 410,000 jobs that were produced in 2013, new payroll jobs, if you disaggregate that data and look a little deeper into those jobs, what kind of jobs are they specifically? Um, the caveat is they aren't jobs specifically that will sustain a family in the middle class or propel someone from the working class into the middle class and able to sustain them over a long period of time. Secondly, if you disaggregate the data, the whole state of California, and you take, for example, the Bay Area, the Bay Area has helped propel the whole state of California out of the worst economic recession since 1929. Now, I'll put this in context. We just got out of the worst economic recession since 1929, and historically we know what 1929 was. It was the Great Depression uh, uh, here in the United States. Now, this is a very resilient state, no doubt about it. But when it comes to educational attainment, and when it comes to incomes, and when it comes to jobs growth, no doubt about it, San Francisco, Alameda, Santa Clara, San Mateo are the counties that have propelled the state of California to get out of the economic recession. Los Angeles County specifically, uh, is economy is growing at a much a slower pace, but it's starting to pick up now. But through a regional perspective, we have much work to do, nonetheless. And that's why I'm excited to be at the helm of the California State Senate, being the first uh, president pro tem of the California State Senate uh, from uh, Southern California and from Los Angeles, specifically in over 20 years. The last time we had a pro tem. Thank you. The last time we had a pro tem, obviously, was then uh, President Pro Tem uh, David Roberti. Uh, that was over 20 years ago. Obviously, he's a Southern Californian uh, here from Los Angeles. But I think that the lens that I will be able to provide uh, up in Sacramento will be a unique lens, obviously, with the perspectives that each and every one of you have uh, in your respective regions, whether it's Riverside, San Bernardino, Orange, San Diego, or here specifically, uh, Los Angeles, or up north of us, up to 101 in Ventura counties because this is a very vital region, not just for our state, but for the entire country. Now, our economy has improved with the combination, obviously, of Proposition 30, which passed a couple years ago. And Proposition 30, along with this economy that is continuing to improve, have put us in a very unique position. It's put us in a position where we're not in the position of making cuts. We made some of the worst and most egregious and draconian cuts uh, in the legislative, his in legislative history because, quite frankly, we didn't have the resources to move forward with investments in the human, in human capital in California. Right now, we have, in the last decade, we have removed our structural deficit, which was about $20 billion. We have done this through a combination of cuts and through Proposition 30. So the spending cuts to ratio right now with new taxes is a ratio of three to one. We are making great progress on paying off our wall of debt, the so-called wall of debt right now, uh, total $35 billion in 2011. We have cut that in half, or I should better accurately say we will cut that in half to roughly about $11 billion, a little more than half, to $11 billion by the end of this fiscal year, 2014-2015. 2014, 2014-15 fiscal year ends June 31st. We're on the pace to cut it down to $11 billion, and we will eliminate it completely in fiscal year 2017-18. So 2017-18, and you've heard the news, Governor uh, Jerry Brown has talked about the wall of debt, the wall of debt that has been accumulated over many decades, you know, whether it's been spending, you know, uh, legislative bodies in the past, or it's been voters, and each and every one of you, as voters yourselves, uh, voting for measures that are good measures at a state ballot initiative, but that cost money at the end of the day. It costs money because when you package the debt and you go to the market, guess what? You have to pay the principal and you're going to have to pay the interest over a course of 25, 30 years. That's all acquired debt that goes back decades and decades and decades. So we're on course by 2017, 18 to eliminate it altogether. And I think obviously the quality of our paper the state of California has improved quite incredibly. We were at junk bond status just a few years ago. 
where it was very difficult either A, to get a loan, or B, get a loan at a very high cost. It would be equivalent, metaphorically speaking, going to a cash you know, uh, check you know, uh, 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 storefront in your community, and the shark loan interest rates that they would get were the position, was the position that we were in as a state of California. The quality of our paper has uh, improved tremendously. Therefore, the rates that we get back now, once we package our deals and go to the market, are incredibly much more competitive. So there is a great thing about the California comeback, because we have come back. There's no doubt about it. The proof is in the pudding, because empirically you can actually verify it and you can quantify it. For Southern California, our comeback has been much slower than the Bay Area, and we have to change that. We have to change that by implementing policies that are very critical for our fa working families throughout Southern California. One thing I wanted to highlight, and I was looking through your brochure here, is the high standards that we have in California. And uh, I just want you to know that we are committed to a path of sustainable economic growth and job creation that, that achieves real greenhouse gas reductions in our environment because having a greener economy and having a cleaner environment and a reduction of greenhouse gases, CO2, into our atmosphere, as well as criteria pollutants, NOx, SOx, particular matter 2.5, that have a real large impediment on the public health and economic impediment in growing our economy are not mutually exclusive or incompatible. I'm here to argue, I'm here to put forth a policy statement and be very clear so there's no room for ambiguity or vagueness with each and every one of you. We can grow this economy and at the same time we can reduce carbon, uh, greenhouse gases, CO2 in our environment. We have to because it's an imperative for the public health of our children, it's an imperative for the environment, it's an imperative that we actually make the conversion of a greener economy and our policies dealing with carbon especially with the policy debates that we'll have in this upcoming legislative year for 2030 and 2050 carbon reduction policies that we can grow our economy in the state of California. The Solar Foundation estimates that the solar industry alone employs over 47,000 workers, of which 25,000 25, live here in Southern California. The Environmental Defense Fund recently released a report identifying approximately 300 businesses in the state's growing clean transportation sector and operating over 400 locations in California. So I want to be clear again that California's climate policy is also an economic development and job creation policy. Case in point, Carl just mentioned Proposition 39. Proposition 39, I was the co-chair along with uh, uh, a Republican colleague and friend, uh, the great uh, uh, former Secretary of State, uh, George Schultz, and my good friend, uh, Tom Steyer. Now, I wrote the vast majority of Prop 39 because, because it came from my bill, SB 116, that attempted to close an egregious corporate tax loophole that allowed out-of-state corporations to take advantage of the California tax system to the detriment of California businesses anchored in the state of California, multi-state corporations. And we were losing $1 billion because of this tax cut, an egregious tax cut credit that didn't behoove California taxpayers, California schools, a higher education system, California businesses, but it behooved out-of-state, multi-state corporations that took advantage of a, a tax loophole that didn't incentivize them to grow jobs in the state of California because their footprint was limited to non-existent with regards to brick and mortar as well as payroll. So it has a perverse incentive if you're a California business and you say you want to grow your payroll because you have the ability to do so, understandably, your CPA and your lawyers will say, well, boss, you know, if you want to stay anchored in the state of California, you can do so but it would behoove you, if you will, to move you know, the expanse of payroll to Arizona, to Texas, to Nevada, or elsewhere because of this egregious loophole that currently exists with a competitor of yours who may be anchored in New Jersey, in Ohio, Texas, or elsewhere. So in short, we closed the egregious corporate tax loophole with Prop 39. It received over 60% uh, uh, the voters support the highest percentage-wise uh, 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 tax revenue enhancements in the last 22 years. And let me put this in context. 
and I think Governor Gray Davis will really, really appreciate this. Regardless of the left-leaning, West Coast, blue, perhaps getting bluer state that California is, it is very difficult to pass revenue enhancement measures at the ballot box. Very difficult. I have the empirical data. It's not perception. I have the data. In the last 22 years, the last 22 years, from 1992 to 2012, we only had three revenue enhancement measures passed at the ballot box. We had then Republican Governor Pete Wilson, Proposition 174. It was a, a sales tax increase that dealt with public safety. Then we had an individual who you all know because he's uh, part of the Hollywood royalty here. You know him as Meathead. It's Rob Reiner. He moved forward with Proposition 10, the tobacco tax, that created the, the first five uh, commissions throughout the state of California in the 58 counties that we have here in California. Then you had an individual who had the audacity to move forward what you call the millionaire's tax. And the millionaire's tax because he wanted to tackle an issue that deals with all of our communities, black, white, Latino, African American, high income, low income, Republican, Democrat, right wing, left wing, agnostic, decline of state, mental health. And he passed his Proposition 63. Those were the only three measures in the past 22 years to pass at the ballot box. Oil severance tax, split roll tax, other forms of personal income tax, other versions of tobacco tax, emergency room tax, all of those failed at the ballot box by the voters of California until 2012. In 2012, Governor Jerry Brown moved Proposition 30, and I, with Secretary of State George Schultz, as well as Tom Steyer, moved for Proposition 39. Those are the only five measures to pass in the past 25 years at the ballot box. So the lesson is it's really hard to pass revenue enhancement measures at the ballot box. It's almost impossible to do so because you've seen a trail of bodies at the ballot initiative cemetery of failures. And when we do, we have to make sure we use the resources in a way that's wise, that you can quantify, and you can measure, and you can verify real employment gains. Proposition 30, with regards to a greener economy and actually growing real tangible jobs that can be outsourced to another state or be offshore to Guangzhou, China, or elsewhere. With Proposition 39, we're going to invest $2.5 billion not $25 million, not $250 million, $2.5 billion over the course of the next five years in our K-12 through schools as well as community colleges for energy efficiency and retrofits and upgrades. The goal is, one, to create jobs. Jobs that are real, jobs that are tangible. Again, jobs that can't be outsourced or offshore. Jobs that are labor intensive and must be done on site. Two, when you commit yourself to the retrofit and to the upgrade, obviously you reduce your energy load. When you reduce your energy load, you capture those savings and you invest those dollars back into the classroom. Whether it's after school programs, whether it's for English language learners, whether it's for children who are on the spectrum, whether they have Asperger's or some form of autism, you have more money on the table that otherwise did not exist when you reduce your energy load. Three, the public health benefits. Obviously, especially for kids in poor regions, especially for those folks who live in San Bernardino, folks who live out in Riverside area because of poor air quality that currently exists right now, today. You have better public health benefits because you have antiquated HVAC systems in these old schools throughout the Southern California. So the public health benefits for the children are quite tremendous. And obviously, we help the environment. We help the environment because these schools don't manufacture the CO2 otherwise that they would be manufacturing because of the retrofit upgrades and the energy efficiency. We will create upwards up to 45,000 jobs. This is larger than any energy efficiency program, any IOU, whether it's Southern California Gas or Southern California Edison or PG&E or SEMPRA. This outdwarfs all that. 
and any incentive program for the PUC. I don't want to offend anyone from the PUC or any of the IOUs are currently here, or any of the POUs, you know, LADWP and so forth. This outdwarfs any of that. This outdoors anything from the Department of Energy out of Washington, D.C. This is huge. And guess what? The beauty of this is your taxpayers, as taxpayers, as individual taxpayers, as local elected officials, your taxes were not increased one single bit. As a multi-state corporation, as businesses, your taxes were not increased because of it. So the question becomes, as Governor Gray Davis said so succinctly and articulately, how can we be creative? How can we actually grow this economy and how can we do so in a manner that doesn't harm the environment? It's not an either-or equation. It's not a world of absolutes. We have to be creative in how we move forward because Southern California is an amazingly vital region. The district that I represent, I represent one million constituents. To put this in context, it's larger than a member of Congress. The district I represent is the most vibrant, multicultural district, not in California, not in the country, but in the entire world. We're right in the heart of my district. And to the right of me, east of us, is the largest Mexican community outside of the Republic of Mexico, Boyle Heights and East LA. To the north of us is Chinatown. Northwest of us, Filipino Town, Thai Town, Little Armenia, to the west of us, all of Koreatown, and also the largest concentration of Central Americans, Guatemalans and Salvadorians, outside of Central America. And just slightly, slightly to the east of us, although not a large population, nonetheless symbolically very important, Little Tokyo. It is the most vibrant, amazing mosaic of ethnicities that is the strength of my district. And it's also the strength of Southern California, because when immigrants do well in California, California does well, and our economy does well in California. And that's why how we integrate immigrants and bring them out from the shadows and into the fabric of our society, how we deal with the issue of greening our economy and doing so in a manner that increases employability and sustainability for folks to be part of the middle class in a sustainable fashion with all the great academic institutions that we have here, UCLA, USC, Occidental College, right over here, Loyola Marymount, Caltech, the great community college system that we have west of us, or I should say east of us over here, uh, UC Riverside, Cal State San Bernardino, as well as uh, Cal Poly Pomona, UC Irvine, UCSD, I don't know if they have in Ventura, but you know, Channel Islands, I think it is, I think Channel Islands up there, and Channel Islands in Ventura, Cal State Channel Islands, they're great academic institutions, and we have to align them with the sectors that are growing in the state of California. Now, so, look for uh, in the very near future in this legislative, legislative session, policies that are going to grow this economy at the same time going to also reduce carbon. We have to be smart in the way we do this. It's not about adding more lanes and adding more freeways because the reality is we can't do that. It's unsustainable. It's a short-term reaction. It's a knee-jerk reaction. It may feel good. You may say we may create more jobs. This is a short-term benefit we get. But it is not a wise investment of taxpayer dollars to do so in the long term. It simply is not. Those days are gone. We have to be smarter. We have to be faster. We have to be much more efficient. And we have to be much more visionary. We can do it here in Southern California. And I know there's a lot of great ideas here in this room. Issue with the regulatory schemes that we have here. There may be regulations that currently are not germane to today's business environment or uh, our environment just in general. Maybe instead of 10 regulations on a given issue, we should only have five or six because the other four are no longer germane. Perhaps they were politically germane at one point 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 15 years ago during the period of you know, Roberti or, or Willie Brown. Maybe it was some political deal that was met. But we have to look at this comprehensively in an exhaustive manner so we can create the jobs and create an environment for job creation. I get it. I'm a, I want my return of investment, and I can't wait for five years or ten years, because if someone's got a better deal for me, I'm going to take my money elsewhere. So we need better efficiencies. There's no doubt about it. I think we have a wonderful opportunity to create an environment 
that's much more efficient, an environment that's much more pro-business friendly, and it's not a world of absolutes. Where it's, if you're pro-business friendly, that means you're not pro-environment. Or if you're pro-environment, that means you love every regulation imaginable and you're not you know, pro-business friendly. I think we can do both. I think we can do both. I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to finish out with this. You may have different opinions on the issue of plastic bags. Some folks may be supportive of plastic bags. Some folks may be against plastic bags. So we had a measure on the plastic bag bill. And it's more a metaphorical example of what we can do and the potential and the promise of what we can do. We had a, ba a plastic ban bill, and it was just that. Just ban plastic bags, period. And I am policy-wise supportive of that. But I also had about 500 jobs in my own district that were tied specifically to the manufacturing of plastic bags. So we had real lives, real working families, real jobs. Primarily, mostly immigrant women, single mothers, who were the ones who brought home the check to pay for the roof to put over their children's head, to put the food on the table, and to put the clothes on their children's back. So these are real working lives. This is nothing in the abstract. This is nothing that's theoretical. Although I do support the ban on plastic bags. So I did not support the ban on plastic bags. And in fact, I led the effort to defeat it on the Senate floor. It was public. You may have read about it. But I didn't leave it at that. Over the course of the four months, I worked behind the scenes to see how we can find a win-win situation. A win situation for workers in the California economy, a win situation for our environment, a win situation for our general revenue tax receipts for the state of California. And I think we came up with a creative solution that eventually was enacted into law and signed into law by Governor Jerry Brown. Now, I have a company called Command Packaging, for example, in my district. And what they're doing now is if you go to all the landfills, and depending on where you live, especially in Ventura County, if you're up near, and this is not the Southern California region, but if you're up in Northern California, in Salinas, in Watsonville, if you're up the 101 freeway in Ventura, perhaps other parts of Southern California. I know especially if you go down to San Diego off the 101, off the 5 freeway, you'll see all the strawberry fields. In all those strawberry fields, you'll see the farm workers. And you'll see a, plastic, a black plastic recycling, uh, not recycling, but black agricultural film. That's the plastic that protects the strawberry and the ground water from being contaminated by the pesticides. Seven million pounds of that ends up in our landfills on an annual basis. Seven million pounds on an annual basis. What Command Packaging is doing now is they're collecting all of it. Not a quarter of it, not a third, not a half. They're collecting all of it together. They're taking that black plastic film, they're taking it down here to Vernon as well to a plant that they opened up in Salinas or Watsonville, one of those two uh, cities, and they're recycling and cleaning that plastic film and they're making thicker, stronger plastic bags that have a use life of over 125 uses. So we're taking black film plastic out of the landfills, 7 million pounds on an annual basis. We're protecting the jobs and most likely increasing jobs at this plant as well as the plant up north, and we're fulfilling the goal of the ban of the plastic bags. The point I want to make here is it's not a world of absolutes. You have to burn some brain cells and you have to roll up your sleeves and you have to work hard at it. It's not the same old tired paradigm. Me versus you, you versus me. Business versus environment, environment versus business. I've had the same conversation with a room full of environmentalists as well too. We can re reach our, re our carbon reduction goals, but we have to show that we can create real jobs for people. We have to do this, and we can do this. You know, I, I know my time is, 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 and I didn't go through half my speech anyway, so it doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to go through my, uh, my higher education because just one last thing, too. 
because higher education is absolutely critical. Uh, a couple days ago, you may have read it, uh, I just unveiled the Senate Democratic Plan for Higher Education for the State of California. It is not a piecemeal approach for one segment of our society, but it deals with a comprehensive package deal for all kids, working class kids as well as middle class kids. For accessibility, one, you have to have the slots existing for you to get into a UC or Cal State school. Two, once you're in the system, you need affordability. You have to have the resources to be able to afford to continue your schooling. And three, you need to graduate on time. 50% of Cal State University systems are part-time students. 50% of the Cal State University system kids are part-time students. It takes an average of 6.1 years for them to graduate from college. Why? Because they have to work two or three jobs because they're from working families. It takes them that much more longer. So we have the resources that we can provide that gives them accessibility, affordability, and you finish and you graduate on time in four years. We can incentivize them money-wise to do so. It's a grand bargain because you get folks into the working economy and you start generating revenue once they secure a job. Once you open up those slots, you get the other kids who can come in to and fill, in, fill up those slots. We opened up 5,000 brand new slots. It's a win-win situation. Sacramento Bee Editorial Board just came up with a thumbs up. I just spoke with Janet Tapolitano, although I, 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 I wish, uh, uh, str strongly opposed her tuition. 5% uh, increase on students. Uh, she uh, is in support of, of our measure. Friends, uh, it's an honor and pleasure to be here with each and every one of you. My door will be open to the ideas that you bring to me that we can move forward collectively to get Southern California moving forward and we can start switching you know, uh, the paradigm and getting our educational attainment rates up, our income levels up on par with the Bay Area and elsewhere so we can once again be the envy not just of the United States but the envy of the world here in Southern California. Thank you very much. Have a good day and have a very good weekend. Thank you. Thank you, President Pro Tem. Uh, we have a, a, a little token of our appreciation. For those of you who don't know, he had to rearrange his schedule to be able to be here, and we're certainly glad he's here. Um, and as you just heard in his remarks, and we've talked about part of our, our mission in, in now because of Senate Bill 375 is a sustainable community strategy. And the true meaning of the word sustainability is built on the three E's, the economy, the environment, and social equity. It sounds like we've got a great supporter of that right here. So very good. Thank you. I came here this morning and got a box lunch to take with me. Yeah.